so we've got a couple of questions and I'm going to sort of uh, combine a few questions that I think are sort of similar. Uh, so since we sp- spoke last about um, spices, uh, so somebody is asking us if um, uh, what happens, can we add uh, tadka to a water-based emulsion? Is that possible? So that's one question that's come in from Mohit Sharma. Sure. So tadka is basically, uh, do you want to combine some of the questions or should I just go ahead and answer this? Uh, since you last spoke about spice, I think this, uh, and yeah, then just there are a couple of things about uh, sure, sure. Uh, uh, pressure cooking and marination. So we'll just take it in. Sure. Uh, so. Uh, okay. So, um, so tadka, I, I'm not sure I entirely understand. So tadka is basically this idea of taking very, very hot oil and adding old spices to it and then sort of adding it at the end so that you kind of give a whiff of the, the primary flavor uh, as per that regional profile, right? So if it's a South Indian thing, you'll do tadka with mustard and curry leaves, uh, garlic and others and so on. And if it is, you know, somewhere else, you Punjab, you do ghee and jeera or whatever it is. If it's Bengal, you might do punch for and, and mustard oil. Um, so um, in that context, I mean, you could add a tadka to anything. Um, you, uh, if you, I don't know what you mean by water-based emulsion. If your if your dish is an emulsion, if you mean that adding that hot tadka will break the emulsion uh, to a small degree, Maybe, uh, but you can strength, you, you can make sure that you have a strong emulsion. So to give you a sense, one example that I can think of is a Gujarati kadi and things like that, right? Or Sindhi or a Gujarati, sorry, particularly Gujarati kadi, yogurt based more korembu or kadi type dishes, right? Um, so yogurt is a weak emulsion, right? And so if you heat it up too much, it'll, it'll separate out and your dish will look terrible. Okay. Uh, so you can strengthen the emulsion by adding a, a rice flour or corn flour and whisk it. Uh, so that actually strengthens or gram flour. Uh, so if it's, uh, in fact, uh, Kadi uses uh, a gram flour to strengthen the yogurt emulsion uh, so that when you add any, when you heat it and cook it or add tadka, it will not break. So that's the way to think about it. So you can add tadka as long as you think you have a strong emulsion. Yes. We've got a couple of You're questions. You're on mute, I think, Tadka. Yeah, I'm sure. back. Yes. Um, so we have a couple of questions about breads. So uh, I'll just combine, uh, Srinath asks, uh, not sorry, uh, this is um, Hari Haran, where is the question? I'm sorry. Okay, uh, so how do tortillas hold a structure as far as you read, corn is yeah. gluten-free? Uh, yeah. How are they able to be pressed into tortillas? And uh, yeah. one more question on bread, uh, sort of, I'm yeah. you know, expanding the cons- uh, universe of bread. Uh, what are the proofing duration for breads and the science behind it by Nivedita? So uh, if you can answer these sure. two questions, we can go okay. to the next. Okay. So uh, the, the, the tortilla one is actually the corn tortilla one is a great one, right? So there are two kinds of tortillas. So the authentic Mexican ones are actually made of corn and uh, the Tex-Mex or the South American, uh, so, uh, South of the US version is usually made of flour, right? Flour is maida. So, you know, we're good on uh, gluten there, right? So the, in Mexico, uh, the, uh, the ancient, uh, the native uh, people in Mexico, uh, Discovered, I mean, I guess almost 2000 years ago, uh, that uh, corn flour, if you, if you kind of uh, treat it with an alkaline solution, uh, it's, it's a process called nixtamalization, right? So in fact, the word tamale comes from that nixtamalization. So that's the process, right? So the moment you treat it with an alkaline solution, the, uh, the corn actually, one, it improves nutrition. Okay? Uh, your ability to absorb the nutrition, it makes it significantly healthier. And two, it adds a certain level of uh, elasticity that while not as uh, strong as gluten, but is enough for you to press into a, a tortilla for it to make a reasonably strong uh, structure, right? So which is why um, you can actually get two kinds of corn flour. In India, in fact, you don't get that uh, uh, nixtamalized uh, treated corn flour that you get in say Mexico or, or in the US. In India, you get uh, corn flour, which is used to make say maki Maki, maki roti, right? So this is your corn roti, that's maki di roti and sarson ka saad, right? Uh, that flour is notoriously impossible to uh, uh, make rotis. And the only way to do it is to mix it with atta, which then adds the, uh, uh, the, the gluten and so on. So in some sense, uh, the, so that is how, so let me extend this a bit. So the way to make any kind of non-gluten based breads, both uh, leavened or unleavened, is that you need either one in an case of corn tortillas, they use that alkaline solution to treat the, uh, which, which cause of kind of gives this uh, structure. The other way is to add starch binders, right? Now, normally starch binders we are used to is very common. We use rice flour, we use corn flour, we use, uh, you know, powdered the dal in many cases to thicken, right? Those are starch binders that we use in our dishes. 
but those will all add or dilute flavor in what you're doing. So um, it's now common for non-gluten free baking to use things like xanthan gum or guar gum. These are really, really industry grade uh, starch binders, uh, uh, thickening agents that a tiny amount, less than 1% by weight of the, the dough and so on, will let you make, say, a millet-based, uh, a millet flour-based roti, bajra, jowar, which are all notoriously hard. It takes a tremendous amount of skill to you know, have them not break in your hand. Patri, rice-based rotis, and so on. So the idea of using these xanthan gum and guar gum a tiny bit will really makes a lot of those gluten-free baking uh, significantly simpler. Uh, so to the second question about uh, proofing time. Um, I, see, the it's like with pressure cooking, um, I don't think you should think of this in terms of time, actually. Um, you should rather think of this in terms of what you're seeing. Um, so in, in, as a general rule in food, time is not a great indicator. Uh, aromas, flavor, texture, uh, visual indicators are almost always safer and better. So in the context of bread, right, um, I would say is that you are, at least when you're proofing it for the first time, um, you're looking for it to grow at least two to three times in volume. So that's really what the indication is. Now, Again, there are distinctions here. Right? So what takes two to three hours um, in, say, London for uh, uh, to rice will take 45 minutes in Chennai uh, because, you know, yeast loves the, the temperature here and it's way, way more active and so on. So in many cases, and fast rising is not necessarily great either for flavor, right? So in many cases in Chennai or if you're in a tropical place, you may want to actually let the bread rise in the fridge for a while. Um, and then again, wait for it to rise two to two and a half times its original volume for you to get a decent loaf of bread, sometimes even up to three times. But uh, if you go above 2.5 to three times, you will end up overproofing it. And then the, the structure is not strong enough to hold the bread and it will collapse on you when you actually bake, right? Uh, you'll, you'll kind of learn it the first couple of times uh, you bake it. it typically go start with about two times. Uh, and then flatten it, shape it again, and let it rise two times again in general. So uh, that's that's how you think about uh, rising bread. Yeah, go. All right. Uh, so a couple of questions on uh, marination, uh, and we'll sort of take them all, I suppose, uh, together. Uh, yeah. Vikal asks, what is the role of acid uh, yogurt or vinegar in marination? Uh, and we have a couple, um, I think, again, it was... Uh, where am I looking at it? Uh, yeah. Uh, Mohit Sharma is asking, that's an acidic medium again. So similar question. Does an acidic medium do anything to uh, yeah. meet over a longer time? Uh, and Shrias is asking, how does equation change when marinating the tarant meat, say paneer or veggies? So we have a similar question also uh, yeah. from someone else about marinating uh, veggies. So Yeah. So a couple of things. So... Uh, Acids, um, acids actually tenderize uh, meat. I, I think the term tenderize, I think, is misleading. Um, it does not turn it tender. Huh? So it, it, tenderizing is different. Okay. So it denatures proteins, uh, which essentially means that it literally cooks the protein. So, but it mostly just cooks the surface, uh, which makes it uh, easier for the surface to absorb and attach a lot of the other flavors that you might have. Uh, and by the way, you just acids is, is not good. So that's why you also sometimes experience cooks. If you see the way they marinate for biryani, they'll also add a teaspoon of ghee. Fat actually is an important element. You'll add in some cases, you'll add a little bit of mustard oil, right? Uh, if you're mustarding, say doing a tandoori style uh, marinade and so on. And what the fat does in combination with the acid is that it allows for these flavors to stick to the surface more effectively, right? Um, so that's really what the role of an acid is. But if you over marinate in acid, that it will turn the surface texture into a complete mush. And that's not necessarily nice. Okay. Uh, and then again, it's, it's a very subjective thing. Uh, with Indian cooking, you know, you can take a 24 hour marinated thing and still make a very delicious dish. And the gravy is so delicious that you're not paying attention to the texture of the meat. There's just so much flavor uh, that you're not actually paying attention to individual textures of the meat. And, you know, you can actually argue that in Western cooking, since you use fewer ingredients. And uh, so they're really razor, razor sharp focused on the texture um, and the mouthfeel of the meat itself, whereas we are not, right? Uh, we can really just make, take rubbery chicken and still make a great tasting butter chicken because, you know, it's the gravy that people are interested in. So that's, that's what acids and uh, fat does in the context of marination. Uh, what was the uh, second question again? What was it about uh, uh, veggies? Yes. So marinating veggies. Okay. So um, for most part, vegetables uh, do not absorb um, or uh, work the same way that meat uh, does, right? So even if, as I said, marination is, is meant to attach to the surface of the meat. 
it's very hard to attach things to the surface of uh, plants, right? Uh, again, there's a reason for it, right? Plants have a evolutionary reason to prevent things from sticking to them. Okay? Uh, that's the reason why your uh, lotus leaf is so phenomenally hydrophobic and water just slicks off it and so on. So many plant surfaces in general uh, will, will be hydrophobic. So, but paneer, etc. obviously is, is, I wouldn't call it a plant. It's an animal product. It you know, came out of a cow. So uh, paneer, on the other hand, the way you make things stick to it is by, again, using a starch binder like basin or some kind of gram flow. So if you make your marinade with all the spices, you also need to add some bit of oil and also some basin, right? Uh, or some kind of gram flow. That is what will cause... Uh, and if you remember uh, what happens when you mix starch and water, amylopectin from your, the first thing, that's what causes all of this to stick to the paneer. And that's how uh, you get flavors to uh, stick to paneer. Again, nothing's, nothing's going inside paneer. Huh? So it's all happening on the surface. So just so we're clear. Uh, again, if you want to get salt inside uh, vegetables, that's hard uh, because salt will dehydrate vegetables. If, but that is the intent. So pickling actually does that, right? So you can actually get the whole flavor and salt and vinegar and all of that into it, but at the cost of the fact that it will discolor and will also sort of lose its volume and so on. If that's what you want, you know, you can do that. So a uh, couple of more questions uh, coming on um, in terms of, uh, so somebody's asking, does adding baking soda to unpeeled potatoes result in a crisper? And we have, uh, we have a similar question. Uh, someone has tried to make your ch chips following your Twitter uh, tip on adding um, uh, 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 baking powder in the cold water. So uh, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, the yeah. or At the same time, maybe we can talk about, uh, so, uh, because we're talking chips and chips require fat yeah. and oil. Uh, someone's asking about, um, uh, uh, we have, uh, what is the best oil to use for Indian cooking? Yeah. Uh, so if you can add um, sure. that too. Yeah. So I think let's start with the whole baking soda potato thing, right? Um, so here we're actually using the, the third trick that baking soda does, which is breaking down pectin. So potato, plant material, plant cell walls have uh, uh, pectin. Uh, pectin is a very, very hard substance uh, to break down, right? Uh, that's why um, it takes more energy to cook a potato than it, it takes to cook a chicken, right? Um, so um, the way this trick actually works is that uh, you want to peel the potato uh, because, you know, in this case, you want to expose the surface that you're actually trying to cook and crisp and, and the skin is not that, right? So again, in, you can still make very, very delicious stuff with the skin on, but in this case, we're talking about the skin off, right? So the surface of the potato, uh, when it hits the baking soda, um, is going to cause breakdown of the pectin on the surface, right? So a lot of that stuff is going to become crumbly and create a, a very groovy, high, uh, more surface area for crisping. So when you then put it in oil, uh, it gets more crispy because there's more surface area that's now getting crisp, right? Uh, so that's essentially what's happening uh, when it comes to that. Now, you, you can do it one of two ways. You can actually just soak the potatoes in baking water and then wash the baking water, baking soda off, and then, you know, you can just directly fry it. Um, or you could take the whole potato, par, uh, kind of cook it, in a, cut it into sort of smallish cubes, and then briefly put it in uh, hot water, uh, along with the baking soda, which will then sort of extract a lot of that surface uh, stuff. Uh, you get kind of water will get white uh, and then you discard that water and then you deep fry that and you'll get a perfectly sort of golden brown roasted uh, potato, right? So that's the, that's the baking soda trick, right? So when it comes to oils itself, there is no such thing as the ideal oil for Indian cooking. And in fact, I would actually argue that every regional cuisine in India is defined by a combination of things. It's defined by the choice of fat, and it is defined by the choice of spice and flavor profiles uh, that they combine, right? So you know that when you kind of combine uh, sesame oil and uh, uh, fennel seeds and garlic and chilies and curry leaves, it will taste chetinad, right? If you take coconut oil, uh, garlic, curry leaves, uh, mustard, uh, and so on, it will taste uh, it will taste like Malabar and so on. So it's likewise, punch for and uh, mustard oil will make something taste Bengali and so on. Or ghee and jeera will take, make, make something taste, you know, generic North Indian or Punjabi and so on. So the, the interesting thing, as I said, so therefore there's no such idea. So the way you should think about it is that in your cooking, you've got to think about the right kind of fat to use uh, for the right situation. Um, so clearly there are fats that you must not deep fry in. Okay? Um, in fact, you must not fry in anything that says extra virgin, uh, hand pressed, cold pressed, because I know that a lot of these urban people are now buying all these, uh, you know, unrefined oils because, you know, they're healthier and all those claims are there. 
So please do not fry deep fry stuff in extra virgin olive oil or extra virgin peanut oil or extra virgin coconut oil because uh, virgin oils or first press cold press oils have a very low smoke point. Okay? Smoke point is basically the temperature at which the oil is like smoking, like becoming gas. Okay? And at that point, uh, the fat, you know, the oil is actually breaking up um, into stuff that's nasty, right? Not unhealthy, but nasty, right? So not nasty tasting at least. So you do not want uh, to use extra virgin oils in general. So in fact, uh, you should use kind of refined oils, sunflower oils and those kinds of oils, uh, which have a high smoke point. See, deep frying happens ideally at around 170 C and above. That's when you, you know, efficiently any less and you'll get a greasy product. Okay. And if it's too high, then the outside will become black before the inside cooks. So 170, 100 to 180 is like that perfect range for deep frying anything. Right. So you want to find an oil that is, is still is, is not smoking at that temperature. So that's when uh, you, you need to do that. So therefore you cannot deep fry in butter because butter smokes at 140 Celsius. You can deep fry in ghee because ghee has a very high smoke point. Okay? Uh, as long as it's fully clarified, right? So not the stuff where you have a ton of the whey and that will become black. If you try to fry, uh, if you're filtering out, you're entirely clarifying the butter and removing all the whey off, then it's fine. You can deep fry it, right? So, uh, which is why you can also deep fry in animal fat, which I think also has a high smoke point and so on. So, um, do not deep fry it for sauteing, use it for more milder, lower temperature use cases. So I think that's the way you need to think about an ideal oil. And then pick the oil as appropriate uh, to the region. See, when you're deep frying, the flavor profile of the oil does not matter. You're heating it up at a high enough temperature that any aroma and flavor it had is all gone. Okay. See, remember that you lose most flavor once you are above the Maillard reaction range at the top end towards the 170 Celsius, you're losing all of that anyway. Okay. So it's not the it's not the fat uh, that matters. And remember that when you're actually deep frying, the fat is not chemically reacting with the food. It is literally only transferring heat. That's all it's doing. Okay? So it's a very efficient heat transfer medium at 170 Celsius. You cannot transfer 175 Celsius of heat from water because water boils at 100. Whereas oil boils at off at 200 or 220 Celsius in case of some of those oils, you're efficiently transferring that heat so you can crisp the outside. Uh, to golden brown and cause the Maillard reaction and the insides get cooked uh, without stuff leaking inside to it. So that's essentially how deep frying works. Do you want to pick one more question on oil? Sure. Um, yep. uh, the, uh, so Pritam is asking, does Satka level temperature destroy the vitamins of the omega-3 uh, from super oils like gingerly and mustard and coconut? Uh, so again, as I said, um, see if you're I would say that I, I don't think your aim is should be to get vitamins and stuff from Tadka. Let me just be clear on that. That's not where you get it from. Um, you, sh you, should, you should be getting it from other places where you're not heating the oil to that temperature. Okay? And if you're not heating the oil enough, uh, you're not, you can't do a decent Tadka either. Okay? So I think it's really just a question of balancing, figuring out where you're getting your uh, nutrients from. And as I, as I said, you know, it's not about look, thinking about uh, whether I'm getting the most out of the nutrition at every single step. Let's just be for perfectly fair. You're doing a tadka or deep frying, you're not doing it for health. Okay? You're doing it because it tastes delicious. Okay? And sometimes you have to do that because we enjoy food. right? So that's the way I'd say. It. Um, if, uh, I'm, and in general, I'm not the expert on nutrition. So if you're worried about how to... Uh, uh, how to actually figure out you get the best out of nutrition, you should talk to someone with a nutrition background. So that's what I'd say. Okay. Uh, a couple of, uh, actually three, four questions that are sort of similar, but to do, do with uh, cereals and grains and bread and things like that. Uh, so yep. Vidya uh, Devadhan is asking, cooking millet or rice powder in a bit of water makes the dough pliable, uh, almost like some amount of gluten is formed. How is that? So that is one question. Yep. Uh, two sort of similar questions I'm going to uh, combine here. Um, so whole wheat bread, Aditi Sharma says, you mentioned whole wheat bread is a bad idea, but it's seen a surge in popularity among the health conscious. Yep. Uh, so uh, do you think this is healthy? Uh, yep. And then uh, can you also talk to, talk about the difference between maida and all-purpose flour and how they work for baking cakes versus bread or pizza dough and things like that? Sure, sure. Okay, good. So I, the first question was uh, the whole don't loot thing, right? So, in fact, uh, traditionally, before these fancy xanthan gum and guar gum and all these starch binders uh, came into play, I mean, you know, our grandmothers and so on were still making, you know, uh, 
uh, jowar rotis and uh, patris and uh, all the other teas and other rice based uh, sort of bread type things right uh, so the trick they essentially use is is again to gelatinize the starch right so if the starch is uncooked then it has literally nothing that sticks right so you're not able to make a actually a dough right but once you cook it right so once it actually reaches once you've actually cooked it to 65 celsius or 70 celsius and the starch is cooked then it becomes sticky okay and that is a reasonable alternative to gluten it won't give you a very strong structure but enough to just hold it together okay so that's the that's the whole idea which is in fact why they will often recommend that knead it in really hot water because that will also gelatinize some of the starch uh, so that you get enough binding so that's how it works uh, without gluten it's not as good as gluten but it's good enough so that's how that works uh what was the the next question also oh, about uh, the whole uh, uh, whole wheat bread yes. whole wheat bread yeah yeah so um in general um uh, you can make i'm not saying you you can make whole wheat bread uh, at home but you can't make it with 100% data okay uh, uh you can it'll it'll end up being very dense terrible bread I mean, if you like it you like it that's fine you know, whatever floats your boat but in generally bakeries will use a mix of whole wheat flour and maida Uh, i'm talking about india right so uh, let's remember that whole wheat flour in the west is not the same thing as atta okay whole wheat flour in the west is basically uh, uh, not just the uh, just the endosperm of the wheat but also uses some of the bran and uh, the outer and also the wheat germ itself uh, has a lot more fiber and so on uh, and more importantly has enough undamaged gluten as well right so you can literally bake with uh, whole wheat flour uh, in the west but atta is not that atta has damaged starch and damaged uh, 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 wheat protein which makes it much harder to bake entirely with atta so generally you'd mix both um, if you like whole wheat bread if you like the taste of whole wheat bread and if you uh, also the other nutrition that you get from um, atta uh, the, the 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 other parts of the wheat plant that is not there in in maida and so on so that's 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 what it is so you can make it except that you need to mix right um, or the second thing is uh, all purpose flour is uh, is very similar to maida uh, only distinction that i can see is that all uh, maida tends to be a little bit more finely ground uh, so okay so let's think about what all purpose flour was meant for in the west okay all purpose flour in the west uh, was was kind of meant for uh, a situation where you can make everything from a cake to a bread so one flour you don't have to worry about all other fancy flours so if you want to use one flour to make both the cake and bread both savory and sweet you can use that so that's what it was meant for uh, likewise in india i think it's uh, it's meant for both people who make cakes uh, sometimes bread and also sometimes things like your uh, parathas naans and so on right so as a result of the fact that it's used for slightly more number of things the milling uh, is a little bit more finer so maida is a little bit more finer than all purpose flour but otherwise largely similar probably has slightly lower protein than all purpose flour uh, and so it takes a little bit more kneading for you to make bread with maida than it does with all purpose flour and uh, the best kind of flour for making bread is something called bread flour which is like all purpose flour but has more protein so that's very ideal and you know, you'll kind of see it if you get bread flour uh, you can actually even in india you can buy it on amazon now right so pizza flour is very similar to bread flour except that it is finely ground pizza flour is a lot like maida from a texture standpoint uh, but it has higher protein so you know it can hold the structure and so so these are the different kinds of flours uh, that we typically use yeah. okay uh, so i think uh, we can uh, uh, can you stay on for a couple of more uh, maybe 10 15 minutes more if the time is up yeah i'm good lots of questions coming in sure, uh, sure. it'll be good a couple yeah. of questions on pickling uh, mowgli is asking which vegetables can be pickled is there a rule to pick with uh, uh, which vegetable uh, to pickle uh, sai prasanna asks do you use pickling in your indian cooking uh, what to pick and uh, pickle uh, and when um, can lactic acid be used with any indian dishes but he clarifies it by pickling means vinegar and lactic acid and not the general chili oil like maavadi or urka that we do right so um yeah see pickling is you know okay there are two kinds of um, so in india what we tend to refer to sometimes as pickle is uh, is basically brined dehydrated brined vegetables mangoes lemons and so on uh, 
cooked in a ton of oil and spices. So the oil acts as a preservative as opposed to the fermentation. So, so that's, you know, it's, it's important. So achar, if you will, uh, urga or pickle is what we mean by that. But typically pickling essentially typically means that you, you put it in an acidic solution or let it ferment uh, naturally. So it becomes acidic. So either lactic acid or one of the other acids, or in some cases you directly dunk it into vinegar uh, and salt um, and then it stays preserved, right? Uh, both. So in India, both exist. So, you know, if you've, uh, if you've been to Kerala, any street side shop will literally have tons of different things that they pickle. Everything from uh, uh, amla to to literally anything, mangoes, you name it. Every fruit, every vegetable will be pickled, uh, and uh, you can. Um, uh, it is pickled in a brine kind of solution, and it is fantastic. Right? So, uh, so it's a way of preserving and so on. Right. So pickling is is there are different kinds of uh, pickling traditions in India. In the northeast, you will often find more fermentation. Uh, based pickling, where you kind of let the the microbes in the in the in the dish in the ingredient itself naturally uh, ferment uh, the food. In fact, you make hot sauces with say bujjalokia and so on uh, by fermenting the the chilies uh, first. So it actually, so for example, your famous sriracha sauce. Uh, the the really the complex depth of flavor from sriracha sauce comes from the fact that the chilies are fermented. Uh, as opposed to just directly just ground and you know uh, cooked and made into a, a sauce that's just blazing hot, it has a much more complex uh, depth of flavor. So yes, yeah, so this I think uh, this is an entire ocean by itself. I don't think I can necessarily answer. Maybe uh, point you to some resources as well. So there's va various kinds of pickling, and you can pickle anything. Uh, nothing you cannot pickle. So at least from my you know uh, having seen this in Kerala, they can pickle anything. Okay. Uh... So a couple of questions on uh, how to uh, save stuff that has been cooked, but is not, probably not right up to the mark. Uh, so Suresh is asking, once cooked, I'm told not to reheat palak or greens. Is there any science there? Uh, and another person, uh, Rochit, says, um, uh, after cooking, I realize the end product is lacking the taste or uh, maybe lacking salt. Any hack to balance food once it's been cooked? So uh, greens, right? So greens actually uh, are very tricky. Okay, um, if you if you overheat or overcook greens, they will turn bitter. And uh, the other thing that happens to greens also is that there's an enzyme called polyphenol oxidase, which is uh, which is there in in most plants. Uh, that will discolor. The whole thing. In fact, uh, what it does is that it steals the magnesium uh, uh, atom from the chlorophyll molecule. Chlorophyll is what makes plants give that bright green color. And when you see something that kind of goes dull olive green, it's because you know this has happened. In fact, uh, one way to prevent that is is which is why when you make palak something, is to blanch the palak in boiling hot water for thirty seconds, and then take it out and then immediately cool it down uh, and then use it in your dish, but don't overheat it, right? So that instant high heat will deactivate polyphenol oxidase so that it stays bright green. And then also make sure that you're not overcooking uh, the palak itself, right? So in general, add it back towards the end of the dish once you've made all your basic. So don't let the palak boil away in its gravy for long periods of time. The longer you cook, the more uh, bitter it's going to get. In fact, uh, for those of you who have struggled to make sarsonka sag, I mean, it is notoriously hard to get right, right? Which is that it will, if you if you do the slightest amount of overcooking of the mustard leaves, it will go bitter. Um, and so, which is why you never reheat uh, uh, palak because it will become bitter. So, so that's def there's definitely that is definitely uh, one element uh, to keep in mind. Uh, what was the second question about uh, balancing food after it's been? Cooked. Oh yeah. So after it's cooked, it depends on what you want to do. Um, so one is it's always important to keep tasting. Uh, food as you uh, um, as you cook it, so that you kind of know um, how it's coming along, so that so that you don't get surprised right at the end. So at at all stages, always you do the taste test, but also keep in mind um, that when something is really hot, okay, uh, it tastes much muted on your tongue. So your tongue actually works um, is at its most sensitive between you know 25, 25 to twenty eight Celsius or something like that, right? Um, which is essentially the room, typical room temperature sort of inside your mouth, you know, uh, and so on, right? Uh, and so therefore, this is why, by the way, uh, hot coffee is okay, but cold coffee is insanely bitter. Okay? It's just too bitter, right? 
hot enough coffee your tongue basically can't taste all the bitterness but once it gets to room temperature it becomes intolerable right so uh, the same thing applies to that as well so you, you always remember that uh, you will think something is taste muted and you will end up adding a ton of flavor to realize that once the dish cools down it's just overwhelming okay so always uh, always account for that right or take that dish blow it wait for it to lower its temperature and then taste it if you have the patience for that right so so that is that is one thing right the second thing is that you got to balance you know same nazrat has a you know fantastic book and the title of the book essentially explains what you need to do so salt fat acid heat okay so um, so you you got a test test for salt okay uh, so most people uh, it's it's safe to uh, most people are very nervous about how much salt they add so it's always safe to add less and then add more as you go along and it's perfectly fine if in some cases you know people need to add salt when they are actually eating the dish okay because sometimes some people will say oh this it's i find it quite ridiculous that sometimes some men will say that oh this dish is does not have enough salt we need to add more salt no, for you it does not have enough for most people it may be quite okay okay people have various uh, salt uh, tolerance levels in general of course indians eat a ton of salt um, so apparently you know um, so there's a the general science behind it is that uh, your saliva saliva salivary amylase has about 0.4% salt in it already okay so any any food that has less than 0.4% concentration of salt by weight will taste uh, under salted so anything more than that will be fine so typically 1% is what people aim for at least in the west but 1% is not enough for india typically indians go 1 1.5 uh, uh, percent by weight uh, by weight and in, in in fact a lot of uh, people in the west will find indian food too salty there is also you know that also happens right uh, so every individual has their own uh, sense and so you know don't shy away from the fact that ask people to add salt you know or squeeze some lime uh, so one is salt so you can always adjust salt at the end uh, uh, you can adjust if if something is tasting flat right the safest way to improve it is actually squeeze some acid okay? which is usually lime juice or some kind of acid right um now remember that some acids are stronger uh, your uh, vinegar is a strong acid uh, lime juice is pretty strong acid right uh, and so on uh, tomato is not strong enough right or yogurt may be not strong enough and so on so typically you squeeze lime but you may not add vinegar it might be overwhelming at the end you might add a squeeze of lime never cook lime juice because that gives it a very bad taste so you always want to squeeze lime right at the very end so that so adding acidity will will really create uh, uh, balance out a lot of flavors right but you most importantly with with salt you also want to balance sweetness okay uh, every good dish will have some amount of sweetness as well it may not be perceptible sweetness like in say a gujarati dish or it's or some dishes in karnataka and so on but without without uh, sweetness your dish is one dimensional okay so never shy away from adding in general the amount of salt you add add the same amount of jaggery or brown sugar or whatever sweetener you have right Uh, again not things like honey uh, especially because you don't want to cook honey uh, you you can add honey right at the end right so you can get the sweetness uh, and so on uh, some some ingredients will naturally be sweet if you're especially if you're cooking with fruits for instance um, they will naturally bring some sweetness so you don't need to add uh, uh, additional sweet uh, sweet sweetness so, uh, and again the last thing you want to uh, kind of balance for is is a uh, 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 umami Uh, again, uh, optional. Uh, if you add a sprinkling of, uh, say, monosodium glutamate, that can also improve uh, dish subsequently. So here's one thing that you cannot do. Uh, very hard to do. If you've oversalted your dish, sorry, there are no science tricks. I know there are lots of uh, stuff. Even I used to think that uh, uh, adding a you know bowl of a bowl of rice or some atta uh, dough ball and then letting it cook for a while and it'll absorb uh, some of the salt. No, it doesn't. It absorbs just most of the gravy. It doesn't absorb just the salt, by the way. Um, so literally, the only way to rescue something. Uh, that is over salted is to add more gravy um and it literally means adding more water or in some cases adding maybe yogurt or cream or something like that if something tastes too spicy overwhelming too uh, intense uh, you might want to add fat right uh, so typically coconut milk uh, yogurt cream are all things that you can add to mute uh, flavors to bring uh, to bring them down a bit so these are the ways in which you can adjust uh, flavors okay a uh, few few more questions uh, so tenmud asks uh, can pork be substituted in most lamb or mutton recipes uh, similar question from joy gosh asking is there any good substitute for beef or pork cuts for making uh, goat curry uh, so these are two questions on pork slash mutton and uh, beef i suppose there's also joy gosh has another question 
uh, is there any uh, good use of fish sauce and oyster sauce in indian cuisine um so um absolutely so you can uh, so it, it depends on the cut i guess um in general uh, pork is higher on fat uh, as a softer uh, cut of meat in general is uh, has a softer mouth feel uh, uh, mutton on the other hand uh, has a stronger flavor uh, while while being essentially a tougher cut in general so i guess it it, it so in, here's the thing so in in general in my experience again this is is just my opinion that you can mostly replace uh, you can you can take the base gravy and replace any kind of meat with it there's just such a ton of flavor in the actual gravy that the 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 kind of meat you use makes little or no difference actually so you could take a pork recipe and replace that with uh, beef or mutton you'll be perfectly fine uh, what you'll you, what you'll have to pay attention is uh, how each of those cuts of meat actually cook um and uh, so they may take different amounts of time and different kinds of treatment and as we spoke about brining they actually might need different uh, kinds of uh, times of brining so tougher cuts of uh, meat and uh, tougher cuts of mutton or beef require more longer brining times uh, softer cuts of uh, pork may not uh, and so you might want to check you know what's the right amount of brining time otherwise you'll end up with a very salty Uh, cut of uh, you know uh, meat and so on so but in general you can replace so um, i don't think uh, and you, it it'll, it'll still be nice so i think that's that's at least my opinion uh, what was the the second question on the use of uh, fish soy uh, fish sauce or oyster sauce oh, yeah. in indian cooking yes so it, yeah so in my experience actually so i have uh, found um, that you can you do it in, uh, uh, i sometimes uh, when making uh say uh, south indian style meat gravies um i will often start um in the tadka process in the oil you know mustard and all those other things add two anchovies okay and sort of just mix the whole thing up right uh, sardines or anchovies in general you can get them dry as well huh? so what they call karwad in uh, in south india or you, you can either use dry or you can use the tinned you know the the, the full the, the fleshy ones right um they add a uh, they add a ton of umami um and uh, because you're adding a small amount uh your entire dish won't won't taste of fish okay. so if that's what you're worried about right um and uh, so that's one way to get the the effect of what otherwise fish oil uh fish sauce a uh, fish sauce is basically very similar is except that it's in liquid form uh it's the equivalent of essentially trying to add an anchovy or something uh to your start of your cooking right at the very start uh. so you can actually um i would say you can use it as a salt replacement um uh, in in many uh i would say mildly flavored gravies um if you're making a i wouldn't recommend if you're making a rogan josh because i think that is such a strongly intensely flavored thing on top of all of that you don't want the flavor of uh, coming through from the fish sauce but in more milder uh, uh dishes uh, uh, absolutely i think it uh, it really makes the taste linger much longer and so on so you can use it as a salt uh, replacement in general yes actually that reminds me a lot of uh chinese cooking uses this instead of salt because it just concentrates the flavor of salt and umami yeah. much better and it just oh, tastes yeah. so much better absolutely uh yes some similar yeah, questions yeah. um madhu is asking uh, how do you understand the archival problem internet is not a super credible source um, so uh, you know where is the circle of documentation with our credibility a uh, couple of other similar questions um uh bharat chetty wants to know when your book is releasing uh similar question again from someone else and then um uh, joy gosha has any good food science books uh, except uh, yours or kenji lopez um so do you want to answer uh, archiving and documentation and when your book is going to release yes so archiving documentation again as i said you know uh, there are two things right so let me uh, um at the same time it's important to recognize that the internet has played a, a tremendous role um in in creating an ecosystem of uh, uh, people who have managed to document and share all these cooking videos and recipes and you know it's definitely improved a lot of people's lives and you know uh for example you know uh you know a ton of the the, the north indian cooking that i've learned is probably been from a couple of channels like nisha madhulika or harpal singh soki and so on um so clearly there is that right so but uh, i think you know uh if you didn't know that that nisha madhulika is very very accurate when it comes to her methods and she there's very few things that she says that are bad science actually 
99.99% of stuff she says is like, oh, spot on. Okay, this is exactly. Sometimes she may not give the right reason, but her techniques are spot on. Okay. But I think what we're missing is the fact that the documentation of how she cooks through the lens of, oh, here's why. Uh, this is why she's doing it. So this is essentially she's doing this to, you know, increase the pH of the dish or sorry, lower the pH of the dish or uh, she's doing it specifically for uh, infusing the flavors into the oil and so on uh, is, is what is what we're missing. Right. Um, and again, in, in also a lot of the really good uh, uh, channels sometimes are very focused on a very specific kind of cuisine. Right. So sometimes it's uh, limited to one region. Sometimes it's limited to either, a, you know, only vegetarian or, you know, very specific uh, limitations and so on. So what we're missing actually is this uh, more formal archival of, um, I, I really think of it as a, it almost has to be an oral history project. Right. So there is, as I said, there is, you know, there's no such thing as a perfect biryani. Eh? I mean, there's literally tons of variations from across the subcontinent. Right. I mean, literally every person, every grandmother, every mother who's been cooking it uh, and who's been learning the way they cook, you know, from their family and so on. It's all, it's all you know, great stuff. I mean, it needs to be documented in its own way, but we need to sort of maybe standardize the larger common methods, right? So it's the silly argument is whether your veg biryani is biryani or not is the silly argument. Okay. Um, the argument should really be whether, Hey, you know what, uh, what varieties of rice can we use? Uh, that can yield us a you know separated grain. So can I use Govindo Bo? Can I use Basmati? Can I use Siraga Samba? And so on. And how long should I cook it? Um, and how should I cook it to get the perfect uh, kind of rice consistency and so on? And other interesting things related to how long I should brine maybe a, a country chicken versus a you know regular broiler chicken and so on, right? So that's the that's the useful stuff. And I think you know that's what we're missing. So. All right. Uh, so I just want to say we'll uh, try and wrap up uh, at 8 p.m. Um, sharp because uh, I think the number of questions are going to um, keep uh, on coming. Uh, and also I'll remind everybody um, who's watching that uh, we can follow up with questions on the Haskeek website and uh, Fish, uh, sorry, Akshay will answer uh, between all the other multiple things he does uh, on Twitter if you want to ask him also. Um, okay. Uh, Couple of questions. Uh, I will uh, ask. So, uh, Garima is saying uh, you mentioned your obsession with fresh cooking. What is the general rule of thumb for prepping meals or uh, components in advance? And how long should you generally store cooked food uh, before it degrades? Hmm. Um, I think if you can answer that, and then we can go into uh, one more question and then wrap up. Sure. So I'm not. I'm particularly not crazy about uh, fresh cooked food. I think in in general, there's an it's an Indian obsession in general. Um, um, I mean, I guess also growing up in a household where I was getting fresh food all the time uh, definitely spoiled me in the early part of my uh, life and so on. But I think you know you kind of grow up and you maybe once you you know go abroad to study or work abroad or live by yourself and so on, you kind of realize that it's just a silly obsession. Um, so you want to optimize your workflow. So I think there are ways to use uh, uh, food science to optimize your workflow so that you can get reasonably fresh food um, in, in a very quick time, um, as opposed to simply just reheating something uh, from the fridge. And those, I think, you know, there's, while well, there's a ton of that stuff in the book, but largely it has to do with things like making base gravies. Uh, so where you take very specific regional kind of gravies um, and make them ahead of time um, and you freeze them um, in small sort of bite-sized portions, which you can then either in ice cubes or small silicone cups and so on. And you can just directly use them um, and you can make a dish uh, pretty quickly. So restaurants do that all the time, right? So um, it, it takes two hours to make a good dal makhani. Um, so your restaurant will get it to you in 10 minutes time. So it's not being made from scratch. Uh, so everything is pre-cooked and it's assembled together, right? So obviously we're not looking for that level of optimization in the home. Uh, it's not like you'll sort of pre-boil dal and keep it, but uh, at least you can make the gravies in some cases, at least for weekday nights. Uh, it really just makes sense. You make uh, you take a gravy of a specific style, you know, and, you know, we can quickly put a gravy together, right? So like I told about the, micro, the microwave trick, you could do that as well, right? Um, with regards to storing stuff in the fridge, See, I, you know, again, I, uh, I do not want to answer the, the nutritional or the health safety part of it. I'll just go with taste. Okay? The taste part of it is essentially that uh, in the... Ashok, we think... Ashok? 
temperature, if the temperature is around say three to five Celsius, what you're actually doing, sorry, am I audible? Am I audible? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. now you are. So, yes. So in the regular compartment of your fridge, it's about uh, three to five Celsius if it's a good functioning fridge. Okay. Um, it's not like all bacterial or fungal activity stops. It's just slowed down. Okay. So remember, if you're putting your bread to rise in the fridge, it does rise. It just takes more hours. That's exactly what's happening to your food. And it's the same effect, right? The same kind of fungus, same kind of bacteria that's acting on your food as well. So yes, there are, you know, there's, uh, there's a couple of days maybe, and then after which it will start to taste funny. Um, so therefore, if you're serious about storing for anything longer than a couple of days, you might want to consider the freezer. Um, and then you can, you know, you have to thaw it uh, uh, before uh, using it and so on. So in general, I find that uh, in India, people do not use the freezer effectively. Uh, use it. You have to store spices in it, uh, store uh, dry fruits in it. Please store uh, 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 basin, notorious, right? So basin, it's almost as if the basin floor comes with larval legs inside it. And that no matter how airtight you keep it, they will hatch at room temperature. So you might want to actually, you know, keep things like a lot of your floors and so on in the, in the freezer for it to uh, stay as long as it needs to. Okay. Uh, so so uh, there's one question I think that sort of leads on from here. What do you think should, the, what are the gadgets you think an Indian kitchen should have? Yeah, I know there's so many of these questions with, and I'm very tempted to say, please read my book and so on. But I think since that's <laughs> coming out later this year, so that's another question. The book is coming out later this year, but I'll soon share a, uh, uh, sort of, shall I say pre-order link sometime in the next couple of weeks. So hopefully. Okay. So I hope Mansi is listening to this from Penguin. Okay. So, uh, that said, um, so kind of gadgets, uh, don't overthink gadgets in general, don't use single use yeah, but the, uh, the only single use gadgets that I use are a weighing scale, which I think is absolutely important, uh, especially if you are, want to achieve some kind of precision um, consistently, right? So if you want to make sure that you get perfectly soft chapati, um, you can't just by memory remember what you did a couple of weeks back when you got it right. So it's always good to log stuff down. Um, and uh, uh, so weighing scale is absolutely useful, especially if you bake a lot, it's absolutely critical. Um, you can't just guess your way through baking it's unless you're really, really seasoned. Um, even professional bakers always are very precise about weights. Um, the other thing is obviously uh, some way of checking temperature, um, either a probe thermometer, which is more accurate, or one of those coronavirus uh, laser uh, temperature, IR, you know, infrared temperature guns, uh, which can check the surface temperature uh, of your oil, the surface temperature of the vessel before you add stuff in and so on. If you've been following my cooking videos on Twitter, you know, that, that temperature gun makes a pretty regular appearance. Fantastic. Uh, we have a lot of other questions that have come about uh, oils and fats and uh, tatka and things like this. Well, maybe we can just sort of do one more round of it. Sure. Uh, so Vasudha is asking, is it better to put the spices after the oil is very hot or put it in earlier and let it heat up with the oil? Yeah. Uh, a lot of questions about uh, which is better, uh, ghee um, or uh, for Indian cooking, is desi ghee better? Uh, and why do you use ghee for uh, curd, uh, tatkas and stuff like that? So, uh, so a couple of things. So one is that uh, uh, whether you put the spices when the oil is hot or versus when you add it to the oil and let it heat along with the oil um, is a choice you make based on what you actually want to do. Um, so in general, um, if you want to infuse the oil with a lot of the flavor of the spices, you want, you want to cook it for over a slow heat slowly till it comes up to temperature. So that's absolutely one way of thinking about it. Right. So, but that's not what you want with the tadka. Actually with the tadka, you actually don't want an intense flavor of the spice. You actually want a milder flavor of the spice and you want as much about the texture. Right. So, it, so when you add jeera uh, as a tadka, right. Into your dal, you're not looking for the intensely strong cumin flavor. You're actually looking for the crunchy texture as much as a little bit of the cumin. So that's why the hot oil uh, really just instantly kills a lot of the aroma of, of, uh, of the flavor while just retaining enough for you to get a whiff of it. So you remember you, most of the ton of the flavor is already there in your dish. You're adding, you're not overwhelming the dish with more spice if that's what you want to do. So if you cook the spices for a longer time in oil, it will infuse more flavor into it. And that may not be what you want, but if you're making flavored oils, that's what you do, right? So you essentially pour oil and let the, uh, spices steep the the, the uh, uh, flavor molecules into the oil over time. Uh, and then you can just add a little bit of the oil when you actually eat. Um, Chinese cooking and Southeast Asian cooking uses flavored oils quite a lot. And I think that's a fantastic technique as well. Uh, what was the second uh, part of this? 
on uh, ghee um oh ghee is oh. it better why do we um, use ghee for ghee it occurred right. yogurt so stuff. so ghee is clearly tasty right i mean it's um, it has a fantastic flavor profile um and uh, and i think see the we also so for example nothing actually stops you from using ghee to make say pasta okay instead of olive oil at the end of the day it's a fat medium right? it doesn't matter right but uh, but we kind of have a strong nostalgia and so we associate we, some part of our brain has this aroma of olive oil very close next next to the basil and tomatoes if you someone who's had good pasta and so on so so adding ghee then makes it incongruous when you find it uh, no I, i may not like but some people may like it may like the experimentation if you will so it depends on the individual right because a lot of taste and flavor perception is very strongly tied to memories um so that's why we sometimes use fat mediums that just remind us of our childhood or what we used to so that's really what we do and the second uh, principle in general is as i said uh for a consistent flavor profile if you will you kind of use things that go well together right so over years and years uh, cuisine of a region has evolved to figure out the specific combination of say mustard oil and say fennel uh, ajwain uh, radhuni or you know nigella seeds and so on really just work well together uh, so you could of course put panchforan in uh, ghee as well uh, it'll work perfectly fine but we kind of have that strong association of that with mustard oil so that's so the same thing right uh, uh, i there's no reason why you should use ghee with the uh, curd based dishes other than the fact that well you know uh, they both came from the same cow uh, i mean basically not the same cow but literally from a cow uh, so there's yogurt and ghee and so milk products in general all work together okay so uh, it's likely to be sort of you know integrated uh, from a flavor profile standpoint so that's no other reason yeah okay i think this is going to be the last question because we'll wrap up after this um two questions on dosa uh, dosa texture and uh, what is the ratio of batter of uh, you know the lentil and the rice and a uh, similar question what is the perf- uh, what is the technique for a perfect crisp but not burnt dosa so okay. you want to answer for dosa questions so maybe the first one you know what i'm going to say is that because it's a slightly long answer i'm going to say okay wait for the book uh, so the, that's the only question i'm going to say you wait for the book because it goes into fair amount of detail in fact there's a ton of science uh, because again um, uh, since idlis and dosas are something that are also um uh, industrially produced if you will both batters as well as you know restaurants make it all the time there's a ton of uh, published science there um that really go into uh, what ratio a uh, 1 is to 2 uh, what versus 1 is to 3 versus 1 is to 4 will yield you different textures based on what you want uh, based on what you want from your dish right uh, sometimes you know the difference may you may see that actually when you make the dosa uh, as opposed to when you actually make the idli right so in general when you ferment the batter the general tip uh, idea at home is that the first couple of days is idli and then after that is a couple of days of dosa and then once it gets really sour uh, is when you do uthappam right so that's the that's that's a general principle uh, ra- precise ratios and so on i think i'll just say you know, wait for my book so at, at least leave some of that stuff uh, i think the when it comes to uh texture um it, it varies i think uh, the way you grind um has a lot to do with the texture itself uh the the fermentation process itself is 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 largely okay it's it's you know as long as you're fermenting it for 6 or 7 hours uh, largely the same outcomes in that sense but uh, uh the the level to which you grind it and so on has a bigger say uh in the in the texture and also other additives right so in general this is just my personal opinion that i think uh uh dosa in karnataka is is it, it, i like dosa in karnataka more than i like dosa in tamil nadu i find the dosa in karnataka to be sort of golden brown crispy um and it stays crisp for a longer time uh versus uh, uh i think the the tamil nadu one is is very thin stays crisp for a very short time and when you heat it hot it's fine but uh, doesn't have that i think there's uh, there's also the use of sugar um, i think in some cases to aid in the caramelization when you actually make uh, the dosa as well um, and obviously i think there's more use of fat as well will make for a crisper and at a lower temperature for a longer period of time will make it crisper and so on all that said and done ultimately also i think uh, using a cast iron pad and anything that retains heat uh, for a longer period of time is generally good uh, for when you want what you need a crisper dosa a non stick pan will not give you a cr- as crisp a dosa as a cast iron uh, a seasoned cast iron pan. uh so i think we should wrap up uh, there are a few more questions about uh, packaged food and uh, i'll preserve it as good for human consumption 
but um, i think this is a yeah it's a nutrition question so i will only say that look you know uh, food scientists are paid to make sure that the packaged stuff you eat will not uh, will not harm you beyond a point that said uh, you know too much of it probably a bad thing but uh, in moderation i think most things are fine so that's really what it is all right uh, fantastic so i think uh, we'll wrap up here ashok thank you so much for doing this uh, thank you all for your questions and your comments and feedback and things like that um uh, more you know a lot more questions are coming up and they are on uh, the haski website um you go to the haski website or you can uh, look haski up on twitter and you can ask uh, questions to ashok on twitter and um, uh, stay tuned for the next uh, session on food thank you thanks bye bye